In the waning days of autumn 1942, a million tons of shipping was proceeding silently on the Atlantic toward Gibraltar, bearing 107,000 British and American fighting men, some well-trained, others not, for the invasion of North Africa. This was the greatest armada to sail into battle in the history of the world. Yet the enemy did not realize what was about to happen until it became an accomplished fact. The invasion was split into three groups. The Western Task Force sailed from the U.S. bound for Casablanca. The Center and Eastern forces left from the British Isles and headed for Oran and Algiers. Virtually all the American troops aboard the transports were going into action for the first time. Just a few months earlier, these men had been clerks, garage mechanics, business executives, salesmen, lawyers, and factory workers. Now, only a few days away, they must be prepared to face the overwhelming demands of battle for the first time. Most of the men were making the adjustment successfully. When the ships were several days out at sea, the troops were briefed on where they would land and taught basic phrases of the languages spoken there. Instruction in French was supplemented by lessons in elementary Arabic during the long hours of waiting. Infantrymen worked endlessly on preparing their weapons on which their lives might depend for the day of invasion. En route, they learned more about their assignment. Soldiers and sailors, it is not known whether the French African army will contest our landing, but all resistance by whomever offered must be destroyed. However, when any of the French soldiers seek to surrender, you will accept it and treat them with the respect due a brave opponent and future ally. Remember, the French are not Nazis or Japs. Our troops had been only hastily trained for this complicated type of landing operation. Available shipping did not permit us to carry along all the forces and equipment necessary to assure success. Of course, we were tense. It was natural. Behind our first military offensive against the Nazis stood American industrial production, now geared to full wartime output. Under the leadership of Lieutenant General Brehan Somerville, Chief of the Army's Services of Supply, the nation had succeeded during the years since Pearl Harbor in converting from a peacetime to a wartime economy. General Somerville's branch of the Army was to play just as vital a part in the winning of the war as any combat unit. Among the millions who helped to do the job General Somerville directed, was Dick Millett, a railroad engineer for the past 20 years. That's the way we used to highball through during the war. Nothing held up priority freight in those days. When the Army said rush, we rushed. We spent a lot of time in the cab in those days, but we knew that if we slowed up on the job, it meant that the men at the front wouldn't have all the equipment and supplies they needed. As fast as the stuff rolled off the production lines, we hauled it to the East Coast. The nation's railroads succeeded in winning the crucial battle of transportation by handling unprecedented quantities of supplies with maximum efficiency. A sizable percentage of American industrial corporations quickly converted to the production of equipment vital to the winning of the war. From the standpoint of production, 1942 was a year of miracles. Most war industries showed great increases in volume output. United in the common cause, the American people in every part of the country forgot political and economic differences and worked as they never had before to make our victory on the battlefields possible. During 1942, the war workers of the United States produced 48,000 military planes of all types, more than the total production of planes by Germany, Italy, and Japan combined for that year. Already, we had learned the lesson that while air power alone might not win a victory, 
no great victory is possible without air superiority. Consequently, the need for airplanes in vast numbers competed with all needs. Everything from beeswax to battleships that goes to make up the nation's fighting power. During that year, too, the U.S. produced some 56,000 combat vehicles, such as tanks and self-propelled artillery, key weapons in modern mechanized war. The American Army has always featured mobility in the organization and equipment of its forces. Our advantage in this direction was vastly increased by the mass production methods of American industry. Large-scale invasions like the North African campaign had their birth many months before contact with the enemy was made. The success of Operation Torch depended directly on the round-the-clock job of millions of conscientious American war workers who produced the vast quantities of the machinery of war needed before the campaign could even be planned. The roadbeds of every railroad line in the country were in constant use. Freight and flat cars, which in peacetime would have been scrapped and replaced, were pressed into service. To help transport the vital materiel from war plants in all parts of the country, thousands of miles eastward to the great port cities on the Atlantic seaboard. At the ports of embarkation, cargo ships were loaded with every item necessary to keeping an enormous army in good health, in good spirits, and well equipped for battle on any terrain. Supplies arrived on the East Coast faster than they could be transshipped overseas, and vast stockpiles soon filled warehouses in eastern port cities to overflowing. As the U.S. approached the end of its first year at war, American industry was successfully meeting the tremendous challenge of the battle of supply. The most critical problem in keeping the flow of supplies moving to our troops overseas was the serious shortage of ships. In November of 1942, the tonnage of Allied shipping sunk by enemy action exceeded the tonnage in the construction of new ships. For the invasion of North Africa, scores of cargo ships were loaded day and night at American ports with the machines of war to be used shortly against the enemy. Slowly, our first offensive against the Nazis was gathering momentum. Three task forces involved in the North African invasion, two from the British Isles and one from the United States, proceeded to the points of attack in complete secrecy. Allied commanders considered it remarkable that the enemy, with all its U-boats, did not detect the presence of three massive forces all converging near Gibraltar. Right up to the day of the landings, our tactics were never clearly interpreted by the enemy. Something was in the wind, the Nazis realized but they had no idea what, until our ships were in position for the assault. The orders called for all three task forces to arrive off the points of attack simultaneously. For the troops, H hour was to be approximately the same in all three landings in the early morning of November 8th. In spite of the inaction imposed on us at Gibraltar, there was work we could do. Already, we were planning steps to follow a successful landing, including the early transfer of headquarters to Algiers. Before the attack, the weather reports from the Casablanca region were gloomy. And I tentatively decided, unless conditions should improve, to divert the expedition into Gibraltar. All our plans would thus be badly upset, but this seemed better than to steam aimlessly around the ocean dodging submarines. Meanwhile, the center and eastern forces had headed for the Strait of Gibraltar. Finally, the leading ship steamed in at night through the narrow strait, and we stood on the dark headlands to watch them pass. Still, no news of air or submarine attack. We became more hopeful. The eastern force, 
scheduled to land at Algiers, was composed of both British and American ships and carried 33,000 invasion troops, 10,000 American and the other 23,000 British. Both governments were convinced that the expedition should be as exclusively American in complexion as it was possible to make it. Obviously, the French African forces and the population would learn soon after the initial landings of British participation. But it was believed that if entry could be gained and our friendly attitude promptly and clearly proved, possible complications would be minimized. All the warships in the two Mediterranean forces were British. The center task force with American transports carried 39,000 American troops who were to land in the Oran area. In the early morning of November 8th, Allied naval units engaged the French. Off Algiers, the Eastern Task Force arrived on schedule, and the troops prepared to go ashore. No one was sure of exactly what the French garrison ashore would do by way of opposing the landing. For 16 hours during the first day, Allied troops poured ashore by the thousands. After feeble resistance by the confused French defenders, who did not understand at first which country's troops were landing, firing ceased on the evening of the first day. The area was quickly occupied by our forces. The Iran assault involved the U.S. 1st Infantry Division and parts of the U.S. 1st Armored Division. In addition, 500 American paratroopers were flown from the British Isles and dropped near the airfield south of Iran. By a miscalculation, some were dropped over the wrong area. Unfortunately, the mission was unsuccessful. At Oran, the landings were a different story. For the invasion of Oran, American troops had been decided upon. For well, the Allied High Command felt that the French, stationed in and near Oran, would bitterly resist the British after the Royal Navy's attack on the French fleet there. The plan called for one combat group to land to the east of the city and another force to the west of Oran. Then both were to converge and capture the city by a double envelopment. After the naval engagement in Oran Harbor, the troops started ashore in the early morning of November 8th. Some 200 miles east, the invasion of Algiers was beginning. And to the west, on the Atlantic coast, the assault at Casablanca was getting started. Some of the assault waves were delayed in starting ashore. The landings on both flanks of Oran went off smoothly. Some units landed unopposed. Others encountered step resistance. During the course of the night and in the early morning hours of November 8th, operational reports began to come in that were encouraging in tone. At Oran, the U.S. 1st Division, which was later to travel such a long battle road in this war, got its first taste of conflict. In spite of incomplete training, the 1st Division, supported by elements of the 1st Armored Division, made progress, and on November 9th, we knew we would soon be able to report victory in that area. On the 10th, all fighting ceased at Oran. The final assault, aimed at taking all of Oran, had been scheduled for noon on November 10th. But the surrender of the French at that time ended the fighting, and the city itself was occupied by American forces. The Allies now controlled two of the chief Mediterranean ports in French North Africa. With the surrender, thousands of French troops who had fought conscientiously under the orders of their Vichy controlled commanders lay down their arms. The second part of the three pronged invasion of North Africa was successfully accomplished. The third and most difficult landing was scheduled on the Atlantic coast of French Morocco, north and south of Casablanca. The All-American Western Task Force stood offshore late on the evening of November 7th and was fired on early the next morning by elements of the French fleet. Oh, 
naval battle raged off the coast all that day, with four of the French ships finally sunk and the remainder put to rout. Meanwhile, the troops were encountering heavy opposition ashore, notably at Port Leote, north of Casablanca. After four days of fierce fighting, the French received orders to cease firing. The minimum objective of the North African invasion was to seize the main ports between Casablanca and Algiers and from them to operate eastward toward the British desert forces. The successful action of the first few days assured its attainment. American and British units which had participated in the three landings, now battle tested, moved forward at once toward the British Eighth Army more than 1,200 miles away. In between were the Nazis. The battle for North Africa had begun. 